Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Real Life. We are thrilled to have you joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Anthony. I'm one of the pastors here at Real Life Church. This is my friend Stacy. Hello. Uh, Stacey, we have some pretty cool things planned for today. Absolutely. It's Bacon Sunday. If you are not here in person because you're watching on TV, you probably have bacon at home. Or you're making bacon. I have bacon here, and bacon. I'm so excited. And maybe you don't like so bacon, bacon and that's church. okay. <laughs> There's mm. a lot of bacon. There won't be any leftovers, but there is a lot of bacon at the church this morning. We're very excited about that. And we have our brand new student minister here, which is amazing. You're going to get to meet him in a minute. It's true. Pastor Jim is going to be interviewing Raul, so you want to make sure you watch yes. the whole service today because that'll be happening before we're back. Yes, that is correct. And then Pastor Jim has a great word for us today. Worship is fantastic. It's going to be a great Sunday, and we are so excited that you are here with us through the screen. I'm going to keep eating bacon. Uh, we're going to worship together, and yes. we'll see you in a bit. Good morning, Real Life. We're going to start this Sunday morning off together singing about the joy of the Lord. It is our strength. So let's sing together. I've got joy. In my soul, I've got peace, it makes me whole. I've got the Spirit of the Lord, yeah, He's living in me. I've got His everlasting life for all to see. Here we go. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength.
one of the things that can allow us to be so joyful is that his grace unearned is always available to us. And one of the things that God impressed upon me again this week in a very real way is that his mercies are new every morning. We have a great and merciful high priest. So wherever you are today, fear no evil. Grace is for you.
Lord, I breathe everything and nothing. My best, my all. You deserve my How fortunate are we that we get to surrender to a good God. We get to surrender to a loving Father. 
a father that's always gracious and always waiting on us. Thank you, God. I pray that he fills our hearts today. Well, hello, Real Life Church. It's Pastor Jim, and I've got somebody to introduce you today. As you know, we've been looking forward to the arrival of our new student ministry director, Raul Herrera, and he's sitting right there. So this is Raul. Hey, what's up, guys? <laughs> Glad you're here. I'm super thankful that I finally made it out uh, to California. And you are from? I am from Michigan, uh, the Detroit area, to be more specific, but Michigan's where I'm from. So very far away, uh, very cold and wet right now. And I was there the first minute Raul ever set eyes on the ocean. Yeah. Not, not just the Pacific Ocean, ocean period. Ocean right? in was general, the first time. yeah, it was my first time It was amazing. Out. It was amazing. It was like a kid in the candy store. Yeah, I, he was like, how is it? I'm like, I just need a moment to take this in right now. I've never <laughs> seen this before in my entire life. It was uh -huh. beautiful, so... Uh -huh. So let's, uh, let's start with the priorities. Let's start with the most important things. What's your favorite place to eat out? Ooh, Chick-fil-A. You're, you're a winner. You're in the right Chick -fil -A. place. Chick-fil-A. Only yeah, because me. it's holy food. That's the only reason that's why. A good, that's a good point. It's already <laughs> sanctified. That's right. Yes. Between bacon and Chick-fil-A, yeah, we win. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and um, tell us a little bit about what you're looking forward to in terms of youth ministry, because you're going to be spending time with a lot of middle schoolers and high schoolers. Yeah, and yeah. So one of the main re reasons I wanted to come to California was it's always nice. And so doing youth ministry in Michigan, I had to plan around the two, maybe one and a half months we had available to be outside. Uh, but one thing about California is I can be outside. We can be outside pretty much year round, right? Yeah. Unless it rains like, I keep hearing it rains like once or twice a year. Occasionally it's a little <laughs> smoky. Just occasionally. Sometimes it gets a little, little smoky. smoky. I flew in, couldn't see. You know, like how people fly into California and they take like the selfie Instagram out the window. I couldn't do that, unfortunately, so I have to travel yeah. again just so I can take the picture. But, uh, yeah, one of the reasons I'm super pumped to be here is I can be outside, and right. we can do fun activities year-round. And that's so new and foreign to me, so that's one of the main reasons I'm super excited to be out and meet new people, have uh, events, you know, around the area, not just here, but around the area so we can, like, outreach to the surrounding communities because you can, and it's nice if it's not smoky. Right, right. That happens on occasion. Sometimes. Okay. So, uh, so it'd be good for uh, folks to check in with Raul. He'll be in the parking lots on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. at our we Sunday morning worship. Uh, and we'll be getting rolling with some student events and activities very soon. So make sure you keep those on your calendar. And it's always perfectly acceptable to swing by the office and bring Chick-fil-A to Raul. And whoever happens to be yeah. sitting there, whoever else is there, that's <laughs> fine too. Just saying. I will not complain. I look forward to meeting you guys. Uh, so right now it's virtual. Uh, I'm sure there's a way we can contact somehow. We'll get a hold of you guys. There'll be some kind of information for that. But yes, I'll be in the uh, parking lot this Sunday. So today, technically, yes, today, right now, as we speak, I'm in the parking lot somewhere hanging out with people. So I'd love to meet you face to face, put a name to a face, face to a name. Uh, but I look forward to meeting everyone and connecting with uh, you and your students. There you go. Glad you're here. Thanks. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Let's continue with worship. Mm. Why don't you go out big okay, in your mouth? Okay, okay. So, welcome back. We are so excited. Raul is here in California on staff with us. Absolutely. But we are so thrilled for our students to have a student minister here who is ready to lead our volunteers, partner with families to care for, and raise up the next generation of people following Jesus. That's you students. And so if you are in 7th up through 12th grade or older, you can go to reallife.la slash students. Make sure we have your correct current contact information so that as we have updates for all of the things that we're going to socially distance and responsibly host for students in the next couple weeks, Raul would love to get to meet you too. So let's go ahead and make sure that we have your correct information. And then speaking of students, a little bit younger, if you have people that live in your house that are zero up through sixth grade, go to reallife.la slash kids. We have our weekly Bible story, family content, all kinds of things there for you in addition to our amazing Real Life Wednesdays. If you've not yet had a chance to sign up, you still can. We have a couple spots left for September. October is on sale and will sell out quickly because that's what happened with September. We have limited spots so that we can keep everybody safe. We have our super amazing new uh, table dividers that let us be closer than we could be if they weren't there because there's a piece of plastic, but we can still see each other's faces. It's awesome. So we had those this week. Um, so thank you, church, for how generous you've been in this season. I'm not sure if I can keep using the words, but that's okay. So reallife.la slash kids for our weekly content as well as the link to sign up for Real Life Wednesdays. I'm glad you covered all of that, so let me eat more bacon. <laughs> today is like my favorite day. This oh is my so good. Uh, another thing that's happening today, 
uh, when the service ends, yes. uh, we're going to be hosting a virtual prayer room. So mm -hmm. uh, if, if it's been a while since you've had somebody pray over you mm -hmm. or if you have something going on in your world that you'd just love to someone pray with you through, yes. um, we'll have some friends. The link will be in the comments section. Uh, and uh, if you just click on that at the end of the service, you'll be able to jump into a yeah. virtual prayer room. We actually have people from our prayer team yep. who will be there to then break out to have uh, some more personal conversations. If you're like, I'd like to say something but not have 30 people listen in, we get it. And so we have that uh, for you at the end of today's service. Part of why That's we're right. in this room is this is sometimes a prayer room. It's mm -hmm. uh, sometimes a youth room. Uh, lately, it has been a room where we're doing our after school program on yes. Wednesdays. Which is great. We like this room a lot. So thank you, church, for how you've leaned in in this season. You've partnered with us to take groceries to families, to pick up medicine to, for people. You have generously stepped into giving in a way that is so extraordinary. Some of you have lost your jobs or have had your paychecks diminished and or you don't know where, what your income is going to look like in the next few months because of the season we've been in. And yet you have sacrificially given so that we could host events here that equip and empower the next generation that help families to win. We are so excited about Wednesdays because it's an opportunity for students and leaders to serve with kids, but also it's this incredible chance for parents to catch their breath again. You don't actually have to know all the answers to math because our amazing leaders help with that. Um, and kids just get to be here, get to kind of be regular kids again, playing games in a safe way, and also sharing a meal together again in a safe way. So thank you, church, for making that happen. We have just over 20 kids here every week and you are a big part of that so thank if, you if you want to step into supporting the mission and ministry of the church it's really easy to do there's a link in the comments section reallife.la slash give or on a cell phone because if you're at a computer <laughs> and you're like watching service you can't also type at the same time totally if you just it. send a text message that says rlla give to 77977 we will take it from there six i think uh, pastor jim is about to go i have more bacon <laughs> oh to eat goodness. and uh we will see you after the message Hello, Real Life Church. It's Pastor Jim. It's good to be with you again. Uh, this weekend, we celebrate the fact that our new student ministry director, Raul Herrera, has joined us and will be here on Sunday morning in our parking lot worship. Uh, we're so thankful that God has called him to our church. And so in honor of uh, his appearance and in honor of all things good, we're going to have another bacon fest in the parking lot uh, Sunday morning. If you're joining us uh, at 10 a.m. Sunday online, I hope you have bacon in your house so that we're celebrating uh, good bacon, baconness everywhere in the world. Uh, our church uh, is especially prone to bacon. I don't know why. It's just happened that way. We actually uh, uh, have been doing this for a while now, and on special occasions, we just pull out the grills and we we make bacon, as all uh, good and decent people should. So anyway, uh, I hope you are uh, enjoying bacon wherever you are uh, today, and uh, God bless your your celebrations along with us. If if you don't run into Raul on Sunday morning, make sure you send him a, a note or swing by and say hello to him. He'd love to get to know you, uh, and so make sure you connect with him in the weeks to come. Uh, let's take a minute and pray, to get, pray today. Father, I do thank you that you love us, and I thank you that you call us to new life and new ministry. You call us to new adventures, uh, and I pray that your spirit would move in our hearts today. Teach us to celebrate the freedom that you have given us. Teach us to use it well. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I was uh, thinking some deep thoughts about bacon uh, this last week. Uh, I'm sort of a bacon evangelist, if you don't already know that. Uh, have you accepted bacon into your heart? Because that's directly where it goes, right through the arteries, congealing along the way, right into your heart. <laughs> so... I have a spiritual relationship with bacon, I just do. Our church has actually done a number of bacon fests through the year, Sundays where we just pull out the grills and make lots and lots of bacon and invite the neighborhood. There are actually four other churches that I know of have picked up the idea from us and run with it and are now doing bacon fest as well. So we've really uh, spread bacon around the world, so yay us, that's, that's good. Because bacon is wonderful. There's a reason why when you grill bacon, it sounds like applause. Bacon on the grill just brings its own happiness with it. Uh, it's, uh, it's just that good. That's, uh, that's what I know about bacon. Um, uh, and think about where, uh, where bacon comes from. Uh, bacon is, is actually food that's fallen on the floor that should go in the trash can. It's just slop, and that's given to a pig, and the pig turns that waste into bacon. It's better than the goose that laid the golden egg. 
it, it, that, like I was not much of an environmentalist until I found out, found out about this one very specific kind of recycling program. That if you take your, your waste food and instead of throwing it away, you give it to pigs, that's where bacon comes from. And now I'm like, we need to save the earth, you guys, in one very specific kind of way. Uh, because bacon is, is wonderful. Bacon is the kind of food that legitimates the other kinds of food. Um, I've never once heard anybody say, would you like some bacon? No, nah, not really. Well, but it's, it's wrapped in figs. Oh, well then, you should have you led with figs. If it's wrapped in figs, I'd love some bacon. No, that's not how it works. It's the other way around. Uh, I, I've heard people go into restaurants and say, I, I'd like some vegetarian bacon. And what they mean is, I'm going to eat tofu, but make it taste like bacon. Have you ever heard anybody go into a restaurant and say, I'd like some bacon, but can you make it taste like tofu? No, that's not how food works. That's not how bacon works. And that's how good bacon is. A bacon is so sinfully good that there are certain religions of the world that have actually prohibited the eating of bacon. You know this? Uh, in Orthodox Judaism and in Islam, they can't eat bacon. Uh, I don't know how you'd ever get anybody to join a religion like that. I don't know, like, hey, would you like to join our, our faith group? Uh, what are your rules? Uh, well, don't, don't murder. Okay, that's good. I'm in. Uh, don't commit adultery. That's good. Still tracking. Don't eat bacon. Oh, hold up. You're obviously some kind of idol-worshipping heretic. Away from me, you doer of evil. I, I don't know how a religion like that would ever grow. Uh, the, the tradition in Judaism goes back to Leviticus chapter 11, verses 7 and 8, where it says, <laughs> that's an interesting one to have memorized, where it says, uh, pigs are unclean to you. Uh, you can't eat them and don't even touch them. And so when in the New Testament you read the parable of the prodigal son, the teaching of Jesus, and this runaway rebel son ends up feeding pigs, it's an ultimate insult. His job is to feed the animals that he can't even touch because they're unclean. He's this close to bacon and he can't touch it. Uh, must have been like torture. But um, uh, I'm so committed to bacon that I'm now a priest in the house of the bacon religion. Um, and, uh, and there's an interesting story behind it. You think I'm just doing a comedy routine up here. This is actually leading something spiritual here. There's actually a fascinating history to how bacon uh, entered into the world and why Christians can have a bacon fest at their church. And it has everything to do with your spiritual life in the year 2020. So this is actually leading somewhere. This is what happened. The Leviticus passage was written probably 1500 B.C., and over a millennium and a half later, God walked the earth as Jesus of Nazareth. And he came to die for our sins and to teach us how we can be in a relationship with him and to liberate the best food the world has ever known. Uh, and this is how it came about. In, in the life of Jesus, in the teaching of Jesus, there was a moment uh, where the Pharisees raised questions about what his disciples were doing. So the Pharisees, remember, are the strict Jewish Religious teachers and leaders who are very legalistic and yet hypocritical, very condescending, go around judging everybody, and they see Jesus' disciples doing something wrong, and they call out Jesus' disciples. Here, here's how it goes in Matthew 15. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. So now, first of all, ooh, gross disciples, gross. Wash your hands before you eat, ooh. The most biblical scholars believe that the disciples of Jesus were boys in their late teenage years, like 18-year-old boys, and there's never been better evidence of it than this. They wouldn't wash their hands before dinner. Ooh, gross. But secondly, what the Pharisees are concerned about here is not sanitation. Our, uh, our knowledge of uh, microorganisms and bacteria and so forth come from the late 1600s. They weren't, they weren't operating with that understanding back then. What the Pharisees are concerned about is that in the Jewish religion, there were all kinds of specific washing rituals, particularly tied to meals, that faithful Jewish people were supposed to follow. And here Jesus is, a teacher, a rabbi, with disciples following after him, and they're not following the strict rules of the, of the Jewish faith. And so what the Pharisees are concerned about is that Jesus' followers aren't being legalistic enough. Why aren't you being legalistic enough? One of our rules is you have to wash in certain ways. You have to wash your hands and the dishes in certain ways before you eat. Why aren't your disciples following the, the rules? Uh, and Jesus will answer back. Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. 
But what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. What goes into someone's mouth is not what makes them unclean. It's what comes out of your mouth, what you say. It's the words that come out of your mouth that can make you unclean, not what you eat. And that actually began the process of changing the rules on the eating of pork for the first century followers of Jesus. And we're going to see how that plays out in the New Testament. I promise this is not just about bacon. This is leading somewhere spiritual. Um, but this is, what, this is what Jesus is saying. It, it's not the rituals that you follow that determine your standing in front of God. It's where your heart is. Jesus will say elsewhere, it's out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. Your words show where your heart really is. And if your words are unclean, then your heart is unclean. It's not your diet that matters. It's not the, the washing rituals that matter. Although you should still wash your hands before you eat. Ooh, gross. But, but what matters is where your heart is. You can go through all kinds of religious rituals and still be far from God. You can go and check in at church on Sunday mornings. You can say the rosary if that's your tradition. You can have your daily quiet time or pray before meals. But all of those can be empty and hollow religious rituals. All of those can just be routine that you go through so you can check the boxes. Jesus says that's not what counts. What counts is the state of your heart. And what comes out of your heart through the words that you choose. You can do all the right religious rituals and still be a nasty and insulting person to people on Facebook. And that shows where your heart is. That matters more. Because out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. What matters is that your heart is committed to and faithful to Jesus. Not that you're doing all the right religious rituals and checking the boxes. Okay. So that lays the groundwork for what's then going to come later on in the New Testament. And here was a, a hot religious debate in the first century world. So when I tell you about this, you're going to think, well, that's irrelevant to me. That's not going on in my world. But actually, things that are going on in 2020 are very similar to something that was going on in the first century world. So let me set up the first century context first, and then I'll show you how that plays out in 2020. In the first century world, uh, in the Greco-Roman world, there were all kinds of religions and all kinds of gods. They believed in Zeus and Hera and Aphrodite and Artemis and all the different gods. And one of the ways that they practiced worship in this polytheistic culture was that they would go to the temples of these various gods and they would offer meat from their, from their animals on their farm to the gods. And the temple could then cook that meat and sell it in the marketplace. And so that's how the, the temple got a source of income. They'd, they'd cook the offerings brought to Zeus from the, the Greeks and the Romans. Now, if you went and bought meat at the temple of Zeus, it signified that you believed in Zeus, that you worshipped Zeus. And if your neighbors from down the street saw you going to buy meat at the Zeus temple, they would think, oh, well, that person is a worshiper of Zeus. So as people started to become Christians, this then became a question, wait a minute, can I still go and buy meat at a temple of a foreign god, or is that betraying Jesus? Will people think I don't worship Jesus because I'm eating meat offered to an idol? Or am I allowed to eat it? Jesus said it's not what goes into the mouth that makes you unclean, it's what comes out of your mouth. So if I'm faithful to Jesus, what difference does it make if I go and eat Zeus's bacon? And this, See, I told you it was going to be relevant. So this was really a debate in the first century, and it comes up multiple times in the New Testament. Can followers of Jesus do something that is not immoral if it will offend someone who thinks it is immoral? In other words, Jesus has made me free. But what shall I do with my freedom? Can I exercise my freedom in ways that will lead other people astray? If somebody would be turned off to Jesus because they saw me exercising my freedom in a certain way, what do I do with that? Do I just go ahead and do whatever I want? Do I beat on my chest and say, you can take my BLT if you pry it from my cold, dead hand? Or do I just give in to the legalists and do whatever the rules say? Well, the Apostle Paul is going to write specifically into that issue. And as much as you might not care about meat offered to idols in first century Judaism, it has everything to do with what we do with our freedom and the love that we are called to. 
Because we are absolutely free from the law, but we are not free from love. Here's what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. So in other words, Zeus isn't even really a thing, who cares? For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many quote-unquote gods and many lords, uh, meaning they're polytheistic, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through, through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We're no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that you exercise that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you, with all your knowledge, eating at an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience... You sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. Paul says, I am absolutely free to eat pork. The rule in Leviticus 11 is canceled. Jesus says it's not what goes into you, it's what comes out of you that makes you uh, unclean. Uh, It's the state of your heart that matters. You can eat whatever you want. When Jesus died on the cross for our sins, all of our sins got what they deserved on the cross. And we're now free from all those Jewish ceremonial laws, the the washing laws and the, the food laws. You can eat what you want. I'm absolutely free to eat it. It doesn't matter if it was offered at a temple to Zeus. It's just meat. I can go eat it. But if by doing that, I cause someone else to turn away from Jesus or to do something that violates their own conscience, I should absolutely not do it. Paul said, I would absolutely give up bacon for the rest of my life if it would save someone's relationship with Jesus. And that's why he's called Saint Paul, because it would take a saint to be willing to give up bacon for the rest of your life out of love of someone else. But that's the teachings of the scriptures. You're absolutely free from the law. The, the old law, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't eat bacon, follow all these rules, and then God will be happy with you. That's, that's over. You are free from the law, but you're not free from love. You are absolutely responsible for loving other people, even when they're wrong. Even when they don't understand the freedom that you have and that they should have. You're still responsible for loving them. This is, uh, this is the, the basic core of Jesus' teachings. Uh, at the heart of everything else is, is love God and love your neighbor. He says that's the filter that you use on everything else. And that absolutely applies in the year 2020. There's been all kinds of furor this, this year about whether or not people have to wear masks. And there are people who say, I, I'm, I'm not going to wear it. It's a violation of my freedom. And they can quote all kinds of data and statistics about why they shouldn't have to. And I, I get it. I don't like wearing those things either. They're annoying. They're uncomfortable. It feels like somebody I don't know is telling me what to do and controlling my life. And I I hate all of that. I get it. But what matters most is that we act in love towards the weaker brother or sister. Towards the person who might look at us and think they actually don't care. For all of their following after Jesus who said, love your neighbor, love your enemy, they actually don't care. Jesus would say, that's what matters most. What matters most is that people perceive, first of all, how much you love them. We're set free from the law, but we're set free to love, not just to do whatever we want. This is the filter that Jesus will use in all things. Jesus is asked in Matthew 22, what are the most important commandments? And he says, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, 
and love your neighbor as yourself. And that then becomes the filter for everything else. When love and the law conflict, law is the lens, uh, love is the lens, not law. View law through the lens of love, not love through the lens of the law. The other one is what the Pharisees did. The, other, the Pharisees said, law comes first. What matters is the rules. And people who don't follow the rules, we get to kick out. And then if people feel loved about that later on, who cares? Jesus would flip that and say, no, no, no. The law exists for the sake of love. View law through the lens of love. Love comes first. Love takes priority over all else. When love and law conflict, love wins. Likewise, when love and freedom conflict, love wins. If you ever come to a place where your freedom to do what you want conflicts with your ability to demonstrate love to other people, view freedom through the, through the lens of love. Love comes first. And honestly, this is Jesus' vision for the church in the year 2020. Come December 31st, after the election. Come next year when we return to some sort of public life. What Jesus wants is for people to say, do you remember 2020? Do you remember how much the Christians loved us? Do you remember that when everybody else was spewing insults on social media, they were so gracious to people they disagreed with? Do you remember that even though they knew they were free, what, what they cared about most is how they affected us? Do you remember how the Christians loved us? They must know something I don't. They must know someone I don't. When everybody else was hoarding toilet paper, the Christians were giving it away. Do you remember how the Christians loved? That's Jesus' vision for the church in the year 2020. How you stand in relation to Jesus has everything to do with how you stand in relation to bacon. Don't miss this. This is, this is spiritually deep stuff. Stick with this. If... On the matters of the law, you're still trying to earn your way to God. You're still trying to earn your way to heaven. You're saying things like, well, I haven't murdered anybody. I haven't committed adultery. I didn't even eat bacon. I followed all the rules. And you think you're going to stand in front of God with that. You're on your way to hell. That's the way to lose in the end. Don't stake any of it on your own legalism. In the end, plan on saying to God, Jesus died on the cross for me. I'm forgiven because he took it all away from me. I'm absolutely free because of him, and I didn't earn it, and I don't deserve it, but I absolutely claim it for myself. We are free from the law. That's why bacon matters in the year 2020. Likewise, if you understand your freedom, but you use it to disregard others, you're in the same boat. If you understand that you're free from the law, but then you use your freedom to go pushing other people around, you're in the same boat. Jesus would have us view our freedom through the lens of the law. Paul would say, I'd give up eating bacon for the rest of my life if it would lead somebody to Jesus. And we should hold on to freedom with the same lens. Uh, understanding freedom only through the filter of love. Uh, I remember um, uh, many years ago having a conversation with uh, a pastor who was much uh, older and wiser uh, than me. And um, I was a young guy in my 20s, and so I, I knew everything the way only a, a young guy in his 20s can know. And uh, we came to a, a conversation uh, over coffee on theology. And we came to a topic that was fairly controversial. And I started to realize he and I were not in the same place on this one. That, that he had a, a different theological bent than I did. And I could, I could feel the hair stand up on the back of my neck as I started to brace myself for an argument. And then he said something to me that I won't forget. Because he taught me a vocabulary. He said... Jim, I like having conversations like this. Uh, and I'm glad that you're a friend that I can have conversations with on topics like this. And it's okay with me if we disagree. We'll still be friends when the conversation is over. And when the conversation was done, he circled back around and he said it again. He goes, thank you so much for this conversation. I'm glad we're friends. And I'm glad we can talk about things like this. We should talk about this again, again sometime. What he did in that moment was to teach me to view even doctrine through the lens of love. This is the filter of Jesus. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Because if they walk away feeling shamed by you when they're done, you failed. But if they walk away saying, we may not have agreed, but 
man, the Christians love. That's the conversation that changes hearts. And wouldn't it be great if by the end of 2020, all over the place, there were hearts that had changed. And people who were worshiping Jesus for the first time because of the way we loved. That's Jesus' vision for the church. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you love us. And I thank you that in your love you set us free from the law and all the weight of our brokenness and our sin. I thank you that you set us free to love and that you teach us to curb our freedom in the name of love so that love comes first and love wins. Teach us to love lost people in your name. Teach us to be gracious in considering their anxieties and fears, their weaknesses and their needs. Teach us to place others before ourselves as you placed us before yourself when you went to the cross. As we do so, as we love, may the world see Jesus and not us. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. God bless you. Happy eating this morning. I'll see you again soon. So what an incredible opportunity we have. We can be known as people who loved so much through 2020 that people were drawn into relationship with Jesus. What an amazing idea that can actually be lived out by you and the people that you know. It's not going to be easy, but friends, you are not alone. We are here for you and cheering for you. We could also be known, you know, for bacon. That's totally. I love that we follow a God who gives us freedom <laughs> and the kind of freedom that leads us towards bacon. Oh my goodness. Uh, it's, it's been a good Sunday, Stace. Absolutely. So don't forget, if you're still hanging out with us and you are ready for prayer, we're going to have that link ready for you in just a moment. Yeah, I think they can actually jump in now. So it's, you're not hurting our feelings. If you leave okay. right now because you're clicking on the thing, we're only going to talk for a few more seconds. So you can actually go there now. Yes. Uh, friends are waiting for you in the prayer room. It's true. But if you're watching this message post September 20th, the prayer room won't be live. It is live today, the 20th at 11 a.m. That's right. Um, so if you're watching this later and you're like, I need prayer. Did I miss my chance? You absolutely did not miss your chance. Send us an email, info at reallife.la, because maybe a friend of yours shared this message with you. Hint, hint, if you liked today, you can like it. You can share today's message for somebody that just needs a reminder that God is for them, that he is absolutely present and at work in this season. We love you, church. We can hardly wait to see you next time. We might not have bacon next week, but we will be I'm going to eat it all. There will be we no bacon left over. We are praying for you. We are cheering for you. We are so honored to have spent this time with you. We will see you soon.